Hello, this is Dr. Caitlin Kite from the Academic Development Team, and I'll be providing an introduction to communication. This session has been designed to help you to grapple with basic communication concepts and how they apply to your life right now, but also to think about how you can apply that to other elements besides your current research and also other career stages as you navigate through and go on to do different things in other places. The session has been designed using feedback from previous participants, so hopefully it looks at a range of topics that are actually going to be interesting and useful to you because it's what others have suggested would be helpful for them as well. Now this whole session is designed not to just be me talking, but to be more interactive. So I'll occasionally ask questions or set you tasks. And although you could very easily skip right on through those and I would never know, I suggest that you do engage with them. Because if you do, this will be much more interesting, it will be much more memorable, and hopefully it will therefore be much more useful for you in the long run. So with that said, let's proceed. Of course, when you're talking about communication, the most important thing to do is to start off by defining what that actually means. Now, communication is what I studied myself as a scientist, and so I'm going to give you some scientific definitions, and then we'll think about what that actually looks like in the real world. So scientifically, communication is the transfer of information between individuals. And this definition is the one that I'm pulling from my animal behavior background and animal communication. Obviously, people who are in slightly different fields might describe communication differently. But for our purposes, this is what I think is most important because we humans are animals. And so uh, animal communication is the type that we're interested in here today. Now, in the definition that I've given about thinking uh, of, of communication as information, that then raises the secondary question of what is information. And again, thinking scientifically, information is something that's going to reduce uncertainty. And that means that it's going to allow you to make decisions and hopefully make the right decisions and therefore um, kind of improve the efficiency and the functioning of the system that you're working in. And in real world terms, what that looks like is basically answering questions like, how should I do this thing? Or if I were to do this, or if someone else were to do that, what would the ramifications be? Um, it's something along the lines of evaluating the competency. So you're looking at information that you're getting from others and thinking, do they really know what they're doing? Can I trust them? Are they telling the truth? There may also be some aspect of thinking, um, what is my rank relative to these people? Is that someone really important? Is that someone who is a novice? And how does that or how should that impact how I engage with them? And these are all the sorts of questions. Again, when we're thinking about animal communication, this is what communication is used for across the animal kingdom in, in lots of different ways. And in our particular setting, these are the receiver systems, if you like, that I'm thinking about. Thinking about one human, uh, communicating with another human in our social world, trying to navigate issues like these. So just to give you an example of how that might actually look in a particular system, I'm going to tell you a little bit of story uh, about one animal communication system so that you can just begin to en envision some of these concepts within your own life. So I'm going to look at birds because, again, that's my area of expertise originally. So in the bird world, let's say we've got this male here who is singing. Now he'll have some motivation behind singing, and as we all will have some motivation behind communicating. And when he does that, he produces his song and throws it out into the world. When the song is out in the world, it then has to move through the world. And as it does that, it may be altered in some fashion uh, because it's bouncing off of a tree or there's wind that's carrying it off in another direction, or maybe it's echoing and so it sounds bigger than the original. Whatever it looks like, it's traveling through the environment and being impacted in some fashion, or perhaps not being impacted at all. By the end of that process, it either has been degraded or enhanced or is more or less the same. And at that point, you do have a receiver who can then pick it up. And that receiver might be looking out for that signal. They might be surprised by the signal. They have various different states of mind and frames of reference that they are bringing to this process. They have different uh, physical abilities that they're bringing to their 
capability in that moment of actually picking up the signal and doing something with it mentally. But whatever those different characteristics look like, there is a receiver on the other end that is hearing the signal and then deciding what to do. So in this case, the receiver is a female. The female might think that's an attractive male, so she wants to go investigate. She might think he sounds unattractive, so she wants to fly away. Maybe she's feeling uncertain and nervous, and she's feeling a bit um, like he might overpower her, and so again, that scares her. So there are lots of different things that might happen, but no matter what, she then makes a decision. Is it flying forward? Is it flying away? Is it staying put and listening for more? But whatever she does impacts the male in some fashion. So if the male was looking for a mate and she flies to him, then he's gotten what he wants. If he is looking uh, for a mate and she doesn't fly to him, then he's not gotten what he wants and he has to keep trying. But in some fashion or another, her behavior or lack of behavior is then going to impact on him and make him do something else. And as you can see, that means that basically we've now come full circle. It started with the male and it ends with the male. And that is a really important thing that I think a lot of people forget when we think about communication. This is not just something that's a one-way street. It is something that creates a cycle here and has a loop that is closed. So based on all of that, which I hope does kind of help raise some issues about communication that perhaps might not be quite as easy to see if you're thinking about humans because you start uh, projecting and anthropomorphizing a little bit and it's quite hard to just step back and look at some basics. But all of those steps that I talked about raise some issues that I think we do need to think about in our own communication, especially when we're talking about communication of research which can be quite a challenging thing, but also in everyday social situations. So what do you think are the four main lessons that could be pulled out of that little story that I just told, that little process that I just showcased? What are the four main things to consider for SciComm? So I'm going to let you think about that for a moment. You can pause the video if you like, and then I will reveal what I think are the four main things that you really need to focus on. All right, so hopefully you've paused and had a think and now you're ready for the reveal. So the first is, what is your message? So that's starting with you, thinking of you as that male bird. What is the message that you're going to throw out there? Now we often have seen in documentaries, so if you've watched the David Attenborough, you'll be familiar with this, that male birds, for example, sing for many reasons, some of which might include scaring off a male that they don't want in their territory or attracting a female that they do want. So right there you've got two different things, two different motivations, and you might have a different message for each. And so you do have to know what is my motivation right now and therefore which message am I choosing. And we of course go through that same process and in fact it might be even more complicated and have many more motivations and many more different options. The second is who's your audience? Again, going back to those birds, if you're a male trying to scare off a male, you're going to have a certain mindset and make certain decisions. If you're a male trying to attract a female, you're going to, again, have very different decisions and a different approach. So you need to know from the very beginning who is your audience. And that is associated with what is your message and, and what are you trying to achieve because all of those things are wrapped up together and that will help you to make the right choice. On a related note, what is the context? Are you doing this in the middle of a crowded space where there are lots of other things that might interfere? Is it just you and your intended audience all on your own, so you've got a one-to-one -one interaction there? Are there lots of other things going on? What are all the different factors that might start impinging on this process of decision-making and production of signal and transmission of signal and reception of signal and so on? So there are lots of things that could get in the way of that and you need to know. And finally, how can you measure your impact? If you're the male, you either have the female come closer or fly away. You either have the rival male stay in your territory or leave. So there are some pretty obvious clues that you can get as to whether you are having the impact that you want. We need to do a similar sort of assessment and look for similar sorts of cues when we're doing um, communication associated with our research or SCICOM, if you like. So these are the four main things that I think we all need to consider, and I want to say just a little bit more about each of those now. So first off, what is your message? 
this is something that I was actually trying to model to some extent with my bird example. So I was trying to tell a bit of a story to help make the point more vividly and to help it be more memorable and hopefully um, translating that information, which is quite scientific, into some um, more easily accessible and more fun, perhaps, uh, formatting. And this is the sort of thing that we all need to do all the time. As researchers, we have a tendency to want to focus on the data, which is what we work with, those raw measurements that we have, and that jargony stuff that we have in our heads, those diagrams that we envision whenever we think about our work. And to a lot of audiences, this is not really helpful. Even to people in our own fields or more or less related fields, this is not necessarily going to be really helpful because they aren't the same experts that we are. They don't have the same expectations. They don't know exactly the same knowledge. And for all human beings, a story is much more compelling. This is just something that's hardwired into us. There's some really good research about how our, how our brains pick up stories, pay attention to stories, and, and remember stories. So to whatever extent that you can tell a story with your data, that is what you should be always striving to do because that will help it really to sink in with people and to be more engaging. So try to filter those raw numbers. Try to visualize how you could take that and make it more uh, interactive, more interesting, more visual, and then create a story from that. It's also important to think about who you're reaching. So what are their preferences? What are their viewpoints? What do they know? What do they not know? And so on. I have an activity here to help you to conceptualize that more specifically. This activity is based on something that probably you are already doing with your research. And that involves giving little abstracts or elevator pitches about your research to different types of people. So for example, you might have described it differently to your parents than you do to your friends. And you might describe it differently to your friends than you do to fellow researchers. So I was interdisciplinary when I was a scientist, and I noticed that even amongst other scientists, I was giving different descriptions of my work, depending on what field they were in and what their expertise was within that field. So let's listen to my versions of each of these elevator pitches for different types of people that I typically would encounter and try to summarize my research to, and see if you can decide which of each of these four groups, each of these four clips, was meant for. So I will go ahead and play each one in turn, and you can jot down notes about which one you think goes where, and perhaps you'll revise those as you go through, and then I will reveal at the end. All right, so that's your first clip. Let's listen to the second one now. Okay, now you can hear clip number three.
All right, and now it's time for the fourth and final clip. All right, so you've heard the four clips, and now you can have the big reveal of which clip went with which audience. So there you go. The first Humans clip have was made and continue to make many changes to the environment, with many negative repercussions for the organisms that live there. Using behavioral, now, spatial, and genetic I techniques, I explored whether uh, one avian species, the eastern bluebird, it, might have found ways of thriving in human-disturbed environments. An expert in, this work aimed to uncover any mechanisms allowing tolerance to human disturbances, with the hopes of then predicting how other species might respond to these conditions and provide any necessary protections accordingly. And actually, what you can realize is that even though it's not even amongst those who are not keen bird watchers, you can still there are obvious the differences, differences in bird populations in the countryside versus those in the city, and, pick up and between those observed in the 20th century and those we see today. These differences in time and space are in large part caused by human activities, and all changes to habitat structure, introduction of chemicals, alterations to light and sound and so regimes. That means that probably While we generally view these changes as having a negative impact on wildlife, so some species seem very human tolerant and may even thrive in anthropogenic environments. I performed observations and conducted experiments really both in the field Again, and in the laboratory in order to understand how and why some birds can adapt to the presence now, of people. I hope this information might inform conservation efforts and help us protect our avian neighbors. But, you know, you can think about also not just changing the focus, but also Even before Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, birds have been used as a canary in the coal mine, so to speak, to identify and study the ecological impacts of human activities. The fall and subsequent rise of eastern bluebird populations in response to anthropogenic habitat modification raises interesting questions about the ways in which birds may be able to coexist with humans. By examining the time budgets, vocalizations, and breeding behavior of eastern bluebirds, I explored the possibility that birds, and perhaps other wildlife as well, might be able to respond adaptively to habitat modifications, thereby maintaining the integrity of the populations, species, and ecosystems that come into closest contact with humans. Birds use acoustic communication for a range of life-or-death behaviors, including territory defense, mating rituals, and sensing or warning others of predators. The transmission of acoustic signals is heavily impacted by the structure of the acoustic environment, which humans frequently modify by, for example, removing features such as trees, installing structures such as buildings, and introducing novel materials such as highly reflective glass and metal surfaces. I collected vocal recordings, performed a series of playback experiments, and generated acoustic maps in order to examine whether soundscapes and anthropogenic environments impact avian fitness. I then used my findings to make suggestions about how acoustic environments can be protected and restored. Where you'll have access to your audiences is also really important because as we just discussed, and as we've discussed in previous slides, some environments can negatively influence the transmission of a message. Uh, some of them can enhance it. So this is kind of the equivalent of what I was saying about trees getting in the way or perhaps something causing some echo and making something sound even bigger and better. You can deliberately try to put yourself in particular environments. So for example, you can go to a trade event in order to target people. Uh, you can go to a particular conference, you can go into a meeting and so on. Or if you don't have much say over the environment, you can also think about what formats would work best in the one that you just happen to have been, get, have, have been given. So for example, uh, if you were trying to target, let's say, farmers who are in a flood zone, um, you might think, you know, 
they're not going to all be in one place where I can access them. They're probably going to be at home on their farms, but I could create a newsletter that I could send there. Or they are going to be accessing the internet while they're at home, so I could create a Facebook group. Or I could e email them all, and so on. So some of the things you might have to think about selecting from are not the most exciting uh, formats. They might not be what you were originally thinking about, but given the context that you're working with, they might be more appropriate. So that's why it is really important to recognize that this is a consideration and you might have to tailor your own messaging accordingly. Finally, you should always build in some way to evaluate your impact. And this is something that we often forget to do with outreach, with teaching, with all, all sorts of stuff that we do. We just want to do a thing, it seems exciting, everyone else is doing it, or we like it, it's fun, and so we just keep doing it. But actually, that is a really good way to waste your time. And I'm not saying that you know tweeting is wasting your time if you really enjoy it, but if you really are doing that because you want to have an impact, you want to create a response of some sort, then it could be a waste of time unless you have hard data showing you that it's not. So you do need to investigate that. And that may be just for your own good. So you want to um, think about, you know, how can you get a more fulfilling experience? How can you get more conversations that will be more fun for you and so on? But it might also be really important if you want to use that activity to further your career. And that includes having good data to put into a grant proposal, uh, being able to request funding because you want to achieve a specific goal and you need to evidence that goal and so on. So you might want to collect data on how many people are you reaching, what changes in their behavior are you creating, what amounts of money are you raising, uh, how many volunteers are you getting based on your efforts. It can look like many different things, but the point is that you should always be thinking about what actually am I trying to achieve and how can I see if I am achieving that. And some of that might also just be how well am I doing? So it's not just a hard number of people or a dollar sign or so on. It is also thinking about, uh, you know, are these people enjoying this experience as well as actually thinking about what I'm doing and changing their behavior afterwards. So there could be a multi-layered approach that would allow you to look at many different things. Now, I've already said a couple of times some words that are going to appear now in this slide and I'd like to look at a bit more officially than I was before. So both of these terms are associated with the idea that communication can take different forms. And essentially what it boils down to is inadvertent communication, which we also refer to as cues. So these are things that are just a byproduct of other activities and aren't necessarily meant to actually create a certain response in someone. And then we've got deliberate communication, and this is, again, what we call signals. So these are things that are designed to modify someone else's behavior. The pictures up above, you can see I've got um, a, a dove and a hummingbird there. If you're birders, you might recognize those. Those are both animals that create noise while they're moving. So a lot of us have heard doves and their wings will kind of whistle as they're taking off or coming into land. And hummingbirds, of course, are named that name because their wings make a buzzing sound when they fly. Both of those things are not meant to express anything. They're not deliberately trying to say we are moving and in fact letting others know that they are moving could be problematic. It's just simply that this is a byproduct of something else they're already doing. Now you can imagine that there are many examples of this in our daily lives. So if you're feeling a bit unwell, you might not care about whether your clothes are ironed on a given day or what exactly you're wearing. So you just pick up what's easy because you don't have the energy to do anything else and you go into work. And you're not trying to say, I don't care about my appearance. You're not trying to say, I don't respect my employers. You're not trying to say, I'm not very professional. That's just a byproduct of what you've chosen to do on that day. But some people might interpret it in that fashion. And that's just one example of many. But you could start to think of all the different types of inadvertent communications or cues that you are giving in a given day, in a given setting, with a certain type of person, and so on. And actually, the list could become really long and quite overwhelming. It's also good to think about the deliberate signals that you are making as you go about your business. So here you can see we've got a wolf howling and we've got some cuttlefish there that are, that are signaling by changing their color patterns in order to try to get a certain response. And again, we have many equivalents of these things in our lives as well. 
This includes really basic stuff like sending an email to ask someone a question or to see if they're free. It is uh, asking someone what they thought of a conference, perhaps, or what they thought of a paper. It is providing advice about a task, and so on and so on. So again, there are many, many examples of these things. And it's really good as you try to become more mindful and more aware of your own communication to try to get a sense of how many of each of these things do you engage with on a daily basis and to try to open your awareness of how many more are happening than perhaps you realize and then to think about each one of those is that what you want it to be so for example if you are someone that wears a certain type of clothing or you sit in a certain place there are certain types of things that you just automatically say um, a really good example of that is if you say the word guys rather than folks for example there are people who might perceive that in a certain way because if you're a woman you, you might not want to hear someone say guys or if you're non non-binary that might sound a bit uncomfortable for you so suddenly you realize that all these little things that just were completely escaping your attention can actually have a really significant impact on people on the receiving end. So it's really good to try to expand your awareness of this as a communicator, but also as a receiver to think about how are these things impacting you as well? And is that causing you to have a reaction other than perhaps what um, was intended or what you perhaps want to give? I'd now like to go through a short task that is associated with this concept. And I'm specifically going to zero in on cues because I think that a lot of people aren't really aware of the extent to which we use cues and of the impact that cues can have. And so I'm hoping to focus on that one to get you feeling a bit more aware and comfortable and then thinking about how that might apply in your real life. So I'm going to go through a few photographs here. And I'm just going to pause after I bring each one up and give you about 10-15 seconds to think about what is being expressed by the people in these images. What are the feelings that are being conveyed and communicated here? So here we go. First one. What emotion or feeling is being conveyed in this image? Okay, here is your next one. What is this person feeling? What are they expressing in this image? Here's the next one. What is being shown here? What is this person feeling right now? Okay, last one. What are you picking up from this particular image? All right, so there are no right or wrong answers, although I will provide some suggestions uh, in the text at the end of this to give you a sense of what my interpretation was, just so you could think about whether we saw the same things or whether there were different things and how that might impact communication if different people are picking up um, different things out of different cues. So I'm going to revisit these images here. And now what I want you to do is think about for each of those feelings and expressions that you were picking up from those cues, how would these different people sound if they were to if you were to see them looking like that and they were to open their mouths and say something to you about their circumstances, what would they sound like? What would the characteristics of their voices be? All right, here's the next one. Now we'll move on to the next one. And finally, the last one.
So the point of this activity, again, is not to get you to interpret these specific images necessarily, because you may never encounter these again. So there is, as I said before, no right or wrong answer. You don't need to have come to a certain conclusion. The point is to get you thinking about the little things in each of these images that gave you a sense of what was someone conveying and, and how might that link up that visual signal with an audio signal. And there probably were certain assumptions that you were making and certain links that you were making. Um, just looking at this image here, this girl looks pretty happy, pretty calm, pretty confident. And so I might, for example, suggest that her voice is going to sound um, relatively happy and uplifted. She probably isn't going to have any uh, wobbles in her voice. She might have quite a strong voice. It might be kind of loud because she's happy, or it might be perhaps quiet if she's a bit shy. I'm not, I'm not sure. It depends on my own interpretation uh, at a given moment. So all of this is just to illustrate that you're constantly taking in all these different sorts of information, and you're looking at different channels. So the visuals are one channel, the audio is another channel, and there are many other channels besides those as well. And you are integrating all of that to make evaluations accordingly. And this is going to impact how you feel about a person, how you respond to them. So it's really important to be aware of what's communicated to you. But it's also important to think about what you are communicating to others, even in ways that you might not be aware of. So are you presenting something like this schoolgirl here? Or are you more like that woman in the first image? Is your voice going to sound like this girl's voice or the voice of the man running in the previous slide? And how does that impact what you were trying to achieve? So just be thinking about all of these different characteristics. So when I'm suggesting that you want to be um, paying attention to these sights and these sounds and all these different channels of information and understanding how they are integrated, what I'm really talking about is awareness. Now, awareness is really important, I would say, throughout life. Um, basically, it's, it's the difference between deliberately choosing a response to fit the circumstances and just kind of going on autopilot. So it's always really good to be as aware as possible so you can make an informed decision about what you're saying and doing and so on. And this is definitely true in communication because what you're saying and doing uh, if you are the communicator, is designed to provoke a response, as we talked about. And so you really want to be making very informed decisions so you can provoke the right response, the response that you are after. And when it comes to awareness, there's actually quite a lot that we can learn from theater. And academics are increasingly taking courses that are from theater experts or are derived from theater techniques in order to better think about how they can apply drama methods to their communication within teaching settings and within professional communication settings. So here's a graphic that shows Stanislavski's circles of awareness, or this is just one version. There are many different versions that are derived from his, um, his thoughts on this matter. So this demonstrates how actors, and in this case you, have to interact with others on the stage, so that might be your colleagues, for example, although you could adapt this to different scenarios, and also in the company more generally, while simultaneously paying attention to the people that they're performing to, so that's the audience there. And information from all three circles has to be incorpor incorporated and accommodated, and you have to be doing that in real time so that you're responding to the situation and taking into account feedback from your colleagues and feedback from the audience. So for me, just to give you an example of how this looks in real life, I spend a lot of my time teaching and often I am co-delivering my teaching sessions with a colleague. So when I'm in there teaching, I'm having to kind of negotiate with my colleague to make sure that we are not in each other's way, that we're supporting each other, that we're reinforcing each other's message. And at the same time, we're interacting with the students and we're trying to pay attention to what they do and don't understand, whether they're engaged or not, whether we're getting a bit boring, whether there's someone who is goofing off in the corner and not paying attention and distracting everyone else. And each of those things changes second by second. And so I might have been about to do something and we'll have chatted about it up front, my colleague and I, but then we see a student does something different in the background than we were expecting. And so we have to make an adjustment on the fly. And the whole session is then a performance and we're having to be aware throughout that performance. And that's just one 
aspect of my daily life. There are many other things I do in my career, in my job, also in the outside world that would fall into this kind of category. So I would suggest if you have a moment, pause this and think about how might this map onto your own situations. How many different situations can you think of in your own context where this is relevant? And who are the colleagues in those scenarios and who are the audience members in those scenarios? And just think about how often might you need to work your mind through all these different cycles and apply these concepts in your daily life. Now I'm hoping that you've just done a bit of mapping but even if you haven't, that's all right. Perhaps you can do a bit of mapping using this alternative version. So this is another way to envision the process that I just described. You can also be thinking about where your energy is directed and the advantages of each of these different patterns at different times. Ideally, you want to be moving towards circle two, which is where you're giving and receiving about equally. And that means that you're really having a good exchange. So again, from my point of view as a teacher, this is quite helpful because I'm looking outward and giving energy outward to my students, but also I'm receiving from them so that I can see what they're feeling and respond to that accordingly. But there might be times when I'm feeling circle one a bit more comfortably, or I'm feeling circle three a bit more comfortably, or there might be times when those are more appropriate. It really depends on the situation and the people. Again, all those basics of comms that we were talking about at the beginning, all those points matter, and so you do have to be quite adaptable. And wherever it is, you want to be thinking about, are you paying attention to what you're saying, to what's being asked, to how your brain feels in the moment? Is it tired? Is it really energetic and you're thinking of things really quickly? Do you know that you're nervous or calm? Can you take the situation seriously or is it a bit more lighthearted? Are you feeling in the zone so that everything is flowing really easily or are you having to really work on it? So these two different graphics, and again there are many more if you were to search online you could find alternative versions, but they start to help you think through how you approach different situations and how you communicate in those situations with the different people and the different situations that are around you. And I would encourage you to again think about how each one of these might apply to the different situations that you find yourselves in. Which ones do you feel more comfortable in? Which ones are more challenging? Which ones might you be able to switch out? If you're doing one thing and it's not working very well, could you try another? And if you can use that information, these visualizations, then you can start to think about how to improve things. And one of the ways that you can improve things is also to practice. And I want to go through a bit of a practice that you can do that, again, is stolen from theater so that you can do something that's a bit more fun, a bit more different, and see if that can help you to engage with these sorts of things in the real world actively. The task that I'm going to set you is a solo improv task. And improv is helpful for cultivating an awareness and a mindfulness so that you can self-scan, pause, think about whatever issue is arising and how to address it, and by doing all of those things, gain control in the moment. And this is something that a lot of actors will do in order to feel more comfortable within a given performance that they are working towards, but also just more generally on the stage and feeling more comfortable that no matter what happens, what, what comes their way because someone else messes up their lines or a light falls down from the ceiling or an audience member gets up and walks out, they can adapt and they can overcome whatever the challenge is. And all of that is, it sounds like a lot of problem solving stuff that isn't necessarily related directly to communication. But the point is that it does give you the same sort of um, transferable skill set of being adaptable, reading the situation, reading the people, and choosing an appropriate response, while also feeling conf confident and comfortable in yourself and your ability to be able to do all of that. So this does really have significant impacts on how comfortable you will feel approaching communication, especially in uncertain situations where you're not quite sure what someone's going to say or do. So a lot of stuff that people are engaging with these days uh, for professional development does look at things like what I'm about to assign you. So practicing with vocals and improv and posture, all these dedicated sessions that can really transform the physical presence and 
the projection outwards from that presence. And this particular exercise is actually taken from a session that is delivered by a professional who has come to our campus before. And this is one that she recommends. So this is not just me making this up to try to torture you. This is genuinely a useful thing. So what I'd like you to do is look at the provided prompts. So there's a PDF that accompanies this where each different page just tells you a little bit about a situation. And that situation is going to focus on a type of person and feelings. And you want to try to think of someone who embodies what I'm describing to you there. And this might be a real life person, a politician, a movie star, a, a footballer, whatever. Or it might be a fictional person, so a character in a film or a book. Whoever it is, just think of someone that you can really envision in detail who embodies those traits in that situation. As you're visualizing them, you've got their, their image in your head, then try to start mimicking their posture, their facial expression, their stance, and so on, so that basically you are becoming that person. Once you've done that, hold it for about 30 seconds or so, and that might feel excruciatingly long, but the point is that it starts to give you a chance to begin to feel the impacts. And it is true that if you are holding a certain stance and you're envisioning certain things, this will start sending neurological signals that will cascade throughout your body. And it's going to then have um, a, a cyclical effect to go back and actually impact your mood and your train of thought. So hold that pose for as long as you can bear it, up to 30 seconds, and then think, okay, how do you feel? Do you feel more like that person? Do you feel more like those traits that I was describing? And if you're really brave, you can then also look in a mirror and see how closely what you were doing matches what you thought you were doing. And that's also really important to try to understand, is there a, a gap between what we're trying to communicate and convey and what we're actually communicating and conveying? And if you're really, really brave, you can share this with another person and get their feedback. So you could take a picture or do a video or go show someone live. And that bit of charades, then you could get a sense having them to, to guess who the person was or what the traits were and see how close they were to what you were trying to achieve. And that, again, can help you to kind of think, am I on the mark here? Am I not very good at communicating certain things? And so on. And all of these sorts of tasks like this can feel a little silly. They can feel um, a bit off mark, as I said, but they do really heighten your awareness of yourself and your demeanor, the way that you communicate with both cues and signals, the way that your mindset can affect your body and vice versa. And the more control you have over these, the more awareness and control you can have over your communication. And that can help you to reach audiences better. So I really suggest that you engage with this, have fun with it, and see if it can start to help you um, to think about your communication in certain situations, but also more generally. So hopefully you've just finished up the task. You've had a go at some solo improv, and maybe you've even shared it with some other people. If you didn't like that one, then there are some other solo improv suggestions that I have. And if you like the idea of improv, but you'd rather do it with other people, likewise, I have some additional suggestions. So just look under this video, and you'll find some additional resources, including suggestions for other activities that you can engage in if you would like to try out some other things that might have a similarly positive effect, but just not quite take that form. So with that, I'm going to draw this session to a close and encourage you to get in touch with me if you have any questions or any comments, and to further encourage you to take advantage of the additional sessions in this module to further building on your communication expertise so you can learn about different aspects and further aspects that will um, build on this foundation and help you feel even more confident and even more able to tackle communication no matter who you're talking to or what the setting is.